Welcome to Fans of the Forge. We're back. Yay. We're back for a week. For a week, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is Master of Arms wrap-up for Season 1, Episode 8, The Blades of World War One. Also the season finale of Master of Arms. Just to start us off, if you haven't seen us in a while, I'm Chris. To my right we have... Teresa. To my left we have... It's Sean. And we're going to get right into it. For this episode, we had Jason Kraus, who is a self-taught bladesmith, had crafted over 300 knives, and had seven years' experience. Andreas Kalani, who was a sculptor and artisan bladesmith uh, with three years of experience. And Luke Delmeyer, who runs a horseshoeing business and makes many of his knives from old files and farrier's rasps, that sort of thing, with 10 years experience. We made a note while we were watching this. Isn't a horseshoeing business just being a farrier? Right? Yeah. Why do they call it a horseshoeing Because business? not everybody knows what a farrier is. I guess. Well, uh, unless there's some distinction. Maybe he runs the business, but, well, no, he, he obviously does shit. it. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, maybe it takes a certain skill to be a farrier that he doesn't do. I don't know. But they showed him putting the, the shoes on. Well, the I'm not saying that did. he can't put the shoes on, but maybe there's something else to it. I, I don't know. Maybe he's, eh. uh, you have to, you know, know something medically about the foot. You know, in order to treat it, because they also some of them treat, you know, bad hooves and mm. and uh, you know sores and whatnot. So I don't know, or there's nothing to it at all. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> and also, they were all 37 at the time. Ah. Interesting that that happened, but doesn't really mean much. Our quick draw challenge: these competitors had five hours to complete a World War One trench knife. Always one of the most badass designs of knife, yeah. if you ask me. This was designed for extremely close quarters combat. Not all looked exactly the same, but they had similar characteristics of a blade for stabbing or slashing, and the metal guard was for punching and hammering. The specs for this challenge, they had to have the dagger portion be four to nine inches long, which is quite a big variance, I would think. I mean, I guess if it's it's a blade that they're going to be carrying in the trenches... It would make sense that it might be a little shorter of a blade, but from going from four to nine inches is a it's a pretty big jump. Yeah. So interesting. And a hand guard that covers the knuckles and can be used for striking. Moving into the actual competition, Jason, he wants to create what he would want in the trench. So he says, I want to scare them to death before I stab them to death. Pretty good idea. All right. If they see a big, scary knife, they... They're going to stop and turn around and run away. Hopefully. And die. Yeah. <laughs> Just drop dead. But Yeah. Anyway, he keeps dropping his knife and, you know, <laughs> is, <laughs> is then, like, pissed off that he seems like he's incompetent compared to the other guys. Yeah, you're really going to scare him that way. <laughs> <laughs> he also sharpens his handle... What, what? He made the D guard. He made the D guard for and the handle. And he sharpened that part so oh, when it's punching, yeah. it's like a blade. That's on right. The guard okay. Well. It's like three. Yeah. Just, that yeah. was uh, menacing. It was definitely scary, but also ex- seemingly. Would you want extremely that on your safe? And then he also said, "I suck at welding," as he is welding his knuckle guard on. Yeah, it was doing a good job. No. Oh wow. We move on to Andreas. He compares them all to X-Men. Uh, I'm assuming that means all of the different competitors as they all have different talents. And he starts with his knuckle guard and Jason and Ashley are both confused by his method. Because basically everybody else started with the knife. Yeah, right? everybody else started with the knife and he's like, I'm going to start with this first and the knife's the easy part, I think. Is yeah, well, I for. mean, he's... He just does... Well, he I think for this one especially, he just did stock removal... Mm-hmm. And I think he knew, he's like, well, that'll be easy. Or he said that. He's like, mm-hmm. I know what I, what's going to take to do that. The guard's going to be the, the part that's going to take me some time. Right. And then we move on to Luke, who starts with the blade. He makes his finger guard with individual rings for the index and middle fingers and then has a space for the ring finger and pinky together. And he plans on MIG welding it to the handle. He then has issues with the size of the pins fitting the holes he had drilled and skips the center pin. 
when it comes down to it, he runs at time. And yeah. He does not include that center pin. He said the the drill bit was missing for the size of pin that he had. And he didn't have time to go find pins that fit the, the holes. Is yeah. that what it was? I, yeah, I guess. So it seems he, so he was able to fit two somehow and didn't have time to fit the, the middle. The center one. Yeah. It's a so. little weird. But anyway... Anyway, moving on to testing. So the test for this was uh, Zeke had to strike a solid block of ice using a series of punches, stabs, and hammer blows, um, testing the tip and edge retention, guard performance, and integrity. So Luke was up first, and his edge held up, the tip held, and the guard, well, unfortunately, was a little too small for Zeke's fingers. Just um, pinching him a bit. Yeah. Um, we went on to Andreas. It held up. There were no breaks. Did well. And Jason broke the block of ice, and um, but he Z couldn't do the hammer blow, um, or they didn't show it. The knife did twist on the guard punch, though. So when he went to it, turned a little bit on. Oh right. But that ice block just broke in half and mm-hmm. sheared out, and it was pretty cool. So, judging for this, um, what they had to say about it, Jason's. You know, he cut the ice right in half. In half. Uh, there was a problem with the guard. Um, and it was more of a fantasy-shaped D guard, which is not historically accurate and was a bit more dangerous than it should have been mm-hmm. during that era that it would have been in. For Andreas, Zeke liked the skull crusher spike on the bottom, uh, but Trenton disagreed and said that the spike is too long for where it is. So if it was shorter, it might make more sense. But being as long as it was, it could pose a danger carrying it. Right, or catching on something, or accidentally like stabbing yourself. Or... Yeah, yeah, he said catching on something, but I wasn't sure, like, catching on what? I don't know. I mean, like, I I'm guess... stabbing. Like, where's, you know, but if you, catch... maybe if you're carrying it on your belt and you try to get it and it catches on, I guess, your own clothes. Catch on your buddy. Could be. Your buddy. Yeah. Tight quarters. Yeah. So for Luke, um, the blade held together, the guard was uncomfortable. Uh, the profile was the most uh, stabby, stabby, as mm-hmm. they said. And Trent notes the lack of a center pin. So, unfortunately, Luke's weapon lost that battle. Yeah. It's just a little bit too much not good about his. Just too much off. Yeah. The stabby, the, stabby wasn't enough to say that. Wasn't it. enough. No. Unfortunately. So, the master build was a model 1913 Calvary Saber better known as the Patent Saber. Um, it was the last saber to be issued by the Army as a weapon, based off of French sword designs with a straight blade instead of a curved blade, and it includes a dramatically designed basket-shaped hilt. Specifications were that the blade needed to be between 43 to 45 inches and must include a fuller for more than half the blade. Um, for Jason on day one, he starts with the grinding of the fuller in bar stock. Um, looks like he's filing and grinding the stock instead of forging. Right. On day two, he was heat treating the blade. Quench looks good, no warp. Working on the basket guard. Day three is spent working on the handle. He ends up making a two-handed saber. Um, He filed a fluted design into the handle, burned the handle, and acid etched the blade. And then on day four, he names the sword after his wife, Allison. In an attempt to make his handle fancier by adding wire to the fluting, he cracks the handle. And his plan is to fix it with super glue and a clamp. Anything that works at that point. I wonder if he was uh, also planning on it being two-handed. or if he. I don't think he was. I don't think so either. Because he was like, hey, it's (laughs) two-handed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a a big handle. A little bit too big. And the, um, the... Making the fluting more fancy came upon looking at his competitor and being like, "Oh, oh yeah, that's right. This yeah. is looking nice. Yeah. Let me do something." And in doing something, he he tried something he'd never done before. I yeah, mean, he said he's never. I've never done this sort of thing before, but I've seen it done, so I'll try to do it myself. That doesn't always pan out so well on a competition. No, show. Um, <laughs> that acid the acid etch though was was pretty nice. It came out like a satin finish. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. it was pretty good. Um, Andreas on day one starts with the fuller line in the bar stock, chooses a very thick piece of stock uh, with his logic being that there is room to fix his mistakes if there's more material. Yep. 
Um, as he's grinding the stock down, he decides that it is too thick, <laughs> and he starts again with a thinner piece. And this time he used an angle grinder for the fuller on the second piece. Day two was heat treating the blade. There was a small warp in the quench, and he promptly put it in the vise and clamped to fix it before it set and began working on the basket card. Day three was spent working on the handle, and he wraps the whole handle piece in leather, which was a nice touch. Mm -hmm. And then day four wraps the basket also in leather. And I think that was the point where Jason was like, oh, let me... Try yeah. to make this a little more fancy. Well, oh my gosh. Like the way he put the leather in there and it, I mean it, it was just so nicely adhered and it just it's smooth. Smooth. Oh, it looked no awesome. wrinkles, nothing. It was and perfect. It was interesting that you know, they go back and forth between the competitors. They were doing basically the exact same thing at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the last note that we have for Andreas is that the tip of his blade looks like a needle. It's very pointy. So for testing, the penetrating test was going to be thrusting through multiple layers of sheetrock and wood. Uh, Andreas made it through about six inches of sheetrock and none of the wood. Uh, Jason made it through six inches of sheetrock and none of the wood also. Did you see how many layers they had? They had a lot of layers <laughs> ready to go. Needlessly. How were they expecting this to go? They, made they it, were expecting they it to go it, like butter. Yeah, it just didn't work the way they were expecting at all. Sheetrock is tough. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, to I just shove something through like that, even if it's even sharp. It's, it's not yeah. Sharp. I mean, I have sheetrock knives and things that are a little more flimsy, but they're meant for cutting sheetrock and those things. You can try putting a hammer through sheetrock and it, you know, it holds up. <laughs> it holds up. So for a sharpness test, um, there's a tack on a sand dummy. Uh, there's going to be a thrust into the neck and slash at the body. Andreas performed well on the dummy. It cut like butter. And Jason performed on dummy as well. It cut like butter. Same Nick phrase. Irving, come on, man. <laughs> cut like butter for both of them. I want to say Jason's didn't, I, I don't know if he just wasn't far enough forward, but it didn't look like it cut as well right. as Andreas's. But he, he still said, hey, I, you know, I was like, uh, okay. Right. I didn't go back and watch it, but I suppose when I'm editing and I'm pulling some clips, I could look and see if they just reused it. I don't think they did. I'm pretty sure he said it for both of them. Uh -huh. I, I'll, I'll make a note of it if it seems <laughs> yeah. like it's the same clip. Um, for the durability test, the sword will then be thrust into a filled 40-gallon glass tank. What like was it filled tank. with? Uh, yeah, it was a fish tank full of, like, it looked like beer. <laughs> but it was really just dark like water. water. It was dank water. Um, so Andreas it glanced off on the first strike, uh, but did bust the glass on the second. The blade incurred some damage, um, actually fraying, and Nick is concerned about it holding up in battle. So it was weird because it did, like, this tiny little hair, curly hair of metal was just like... But where did that even come from? It was bar stock. When it was the glass, like was able to shave oh. some of the metal off, and I'm, yeah. it probably makes sense that it might, it might have come from the fuller, just because of where the change is right. in the shape. Um, and for Jason, it also glanced off on the first strike, but also bust through the glass on the second. The blade incurred some damage in that it took a bend toward the handle area, almost. Yeah, toward pretty tandem. noticeable bend. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know uh, if you noticed this, but during the first uh, test with the sheetrock, for Jason, it looked like when it went through, it almost looked like his tip came off. So if you look at that clip, and I don't know if it was just a piece of sheetrock just coming off of the tip, but then it looks like there's a pointed part just kind of falling down, and then it doesn't look like his sword has a tip on it. So I don't know if it did before or not. Um, interesting. Oh, we'll look into that yeah. because it seems like they would have probably mentioned I think that. they would have mentioned yeah. that too, but if I think because they showed the clip twice and I'm like, that looks like a tip just disappearing off, huh. but maybe it didn't have one and it's just a piece of sheetrock that took a shape, like a triangle shape and just, yeah. So anyway, moving on to final judging. So for Jason, Trenton thinks the blade is cool looking, the fuller is straight and even and notes the bend. Uh, Zeke notes the large handle, even for him. Yeah, for his yeah. giant <laughs> meat hooks of hands. Yeah. 
And Ashley notes issues with the water tank. Um, notes this, this, the historical inaccuracy of the large handle. For Andreas, Ashley says it's historically accurate, but did not improve upon the original design. What she means by that is, who knows? Because she didn't elaborate at all. And I really want, I was like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> right? It's more like he made a duplicate of an existing thing instead of. I was like, going to make it better. Whatever Jason did to make it better. <laughs> what did he do to make it better? His, I don't his know. His bent and his <laughs> handle was too big. It was too big. <laughs> so, and he didn't improve on it. <laughs> she didn't say what to do to improve on it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. Did did they say that at the beginning that they were supposed to improve no. on the original design? Uh, I don't recall. No, that. I don't. I don't. No, they did not say anything about improving upon it. I think it was it still kind of no. I think it was still it was kind of like open. Like, or maybe it was uh, for the trench knife. Mm. You know, it was like, make it your, your, we'll do whatever you want with it. But, you know, in the confines of being a trench knife. Yep. Maybe it's kind of the same for this. But I don't know what you're going to do to improve upon a sword like this that had, you know, parameters. You make it shoot fire. I don't know <laughs> what you're going to do. But that's not historically accurate. But does it improve on the design? Double edged sword right there. Uh, Zeke notes the roll in the edge, and Trenton compliments the difficulty of lining the basket guard with leather. So I was like, well, this is kind of close. I wanted Andreas to win. I thought he should, and he does. Woo! So good job, Andreas, for winning Master of Arms finale episode. Finale episode. Congratulations. And that wraps up our season one. Master of Arms. Master of Arms series of wrap-ups. Yeah, let's see if they can improve on the original design <laughs> next season. Well, it remains to be seen that they have a second season. I haven't heard any announcements yet, mm. but um, I think they'll probably be finding out soon, and you know, maybe we'll hear something soon about that. But uh, overall, let's do a little breakdown of the show for the season. What okay. do you think about it? So at first we were all kind of on the fence about whether or not it was just another Forge and Fire clone, right? And it seemed yes. like it. Yes. And it very quickly set itself apart um, that has a better set in general, I think, than Forge and Fire. It has less competitors, less testing, which allows them to focus more on the details of the build. True. So... It, and that's the kind of thing we like to see is the craftsmanship aspect. In yeah, because in Forge of Fire, like round two testing can go on for a long time. Oh, yeah. You know, it, that's just to whittle it down to the final build. Um, so this one, it, it's it's a simple test typically, and then who, who makes it, and then you get to see them spread out that build Every day you see them working on their final weapon, which is cool. Or Fortune Fire, it's like day one, day two, day five, or something like that, you know. And, and well, it, I mean, just the amount of time that they give for that in airtime is probably almost double the amount that Fortune Fire is giving. I, I would say, especially for the, yeah, for the final round, most definitely, because you don't see when they're at their home forges, it's it's, it's barely. Oh no, I got a problem. Cut the commercial back. Okay, well, that problem's all fixed now. I'm just sharpening the blade. You know, you don't see much happening. Um, they stick the metal in the forge. It comes out. They hammer it. And then next day, they're putting a handle on it. You know, yeah. it's there's not a lot to it. This, I can really appreciate what they're doing and, and seeing what they're doing. So there's that. There's also the fact that they're both working in the same shop alongside each other with the same Same tools. tools. So it doesn't allow one to have a competitive advantage because they have more power tools than the other guy. The only advantage is their skill set. Right. Which is what this competition is right. about. So what do you, you think? You took my thing. Oh, I'm then... sorry. <laughs> I took your thing. You did. I was going to talk about the, them being in the forge together for the last competition. Anything else? You took it. No, I didn't have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, honey. But overall, I would say... It definitely stood apart from Forge and Fire as its own show. And yeah. guns. And guns. Yeah, I like the addition of guns. And, and bows. bows. Yep. A crossbow and a regular bow. Yeah. Which Forge and Fire did do the in crossbow. Season 5. Yeah. The, the steel takedown bow. Right. Um, but I don't know. I, th I I do like the gun aspect of it and the 
there's a little there's a different skill set for for building the components of a gun than there is a knife and they didn't focus on just blades like fortune fire I, typically does and so. now i know what a frizzin is yes a frizzin <laughs> it just pops in my head time to time or <laughs> if i see a show that's got like an old weapon like i was watching history put out a, a like a little mini series um Men Who Built America, Frontiersmen, and yeah. they show them with old weapons. I'm like, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Frizzin, I see it. <laughs> so, all in all, I would like to say good job, everyone involved with the show. I think your first season went great. I hope it does well. I hope you guys get picked up for a season two. And, uh, you know, if you're going to be shooting season two and you want to invite us down to visit the set or something, we wouldn't say no. Especially Pennsylvania's not that far away. (laughs) Um, But that being said, that's it. That's the wrap-up. That's it. Remember to subscribe to our page, like all of our stuff, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and wherever else we may be. If you listen to the podcast, leave a review, or a five-star review for that matter. And um, that's it. That's everything. We're almost to... 1,000 Instagram followers. Nice. Ooh. We are at 910 or so. Right Whoa. Now, which, when we started back in May, think about that. That's from May. <laughs> yeah. We, we never would have thought it would have gotten anywhere near this popular. And we just broke 300 YouTube subscribers not long ago. Oh, all right. So nice. our numbers are growing, and you should come with us. Subscribe to the channel. You probably are with us. If you're already with us, thank you very much. And yeah. watch our Instagram account because we'll have something for 1,000 followers. I guarantee it. We don't know what it is yet, but we'll have something. And what else can I say? Mm. Um, any upcoming things? Forge and Fire coming back February Yep, in, in about three weeks. February 6th? Something February like that. 6th. Oh. So maybe about a little over three weeks. Also, in a little over three weeks... There's an event happening in Dragon's Breath Forge in Wolcott, Connecticut. It is called the Hot Sauce Hammer Off. And it's an event that uh, I somehow got myself involved in. I was actually asked by the guys from Dragon's Breath Forge if I wanted to do a little bit of work with them when it comes to videography and production and editing. And they came to me with this idea, and I was like, that sounds cool. So it's a hot sauce competition while two bladesmiths try to recreate a knife that was made by Peter Burt, who owns it. And it's going to be Mareko Mamasi versus Jamie Lundell. It's going to be fun. There's going to be room for some people. So if you're local and you want to visit, I'm pretty sure you can come down and watch it and maybe even have a chance of being in the video itself because there will be audience interviews and possibly audience partaking in some of the hot sauces as well. Oh. Some interesting All stuff. Right. It's going to be fun. I'll be there, you know, taking video and helping out. And it's going to be a cool event. Looking forward to it. In the meantime, we don't really have anything else to do wrap ups for for the next couple weeks because all of our shows are currently off. They all dried up. So they'll be back. They'll be back again, Forge and Fire, February 6th. Unless you want to do a show on Curse of Oak Island. No. No. Moonshiners? No, no. Oh. We we do enough shows as it is. But that knife being said, fight. knife night fight starts. Oh yeah, night fight. There's weeks. been some promos on that. So that, that looks starts soon. Brutal. Yeah, their fighting looks really crazy. <laughs> and people are getting hurt. So we're gonna at least w- <laughs> so excited. People we're are getting hurt. That. Yeah, it's we're gonna watch like that a- for sure. I don't think we're gonna do wrap ups for <laughs> it, but we're gonna watch it. Beat up bad. In the meantime, we do have people that we're looking to get interviewed, and we just need to put together an interview schedule. So that'll probably be the content for the fe- next couple weeks. Is gonna be a number of interviews, maybe with some people that we owe interviews to that we said we talked to months ago and kind of dropped the ball on. Sorry, Bill Clinton. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Hey. Anyway, this video is going on way too long, so we'll call it a night. Thanks right. again for watching. See ya. Bye. Later. Recording, check, check, check. Yep, okay. All right. Three, two. Uh, Let me start that again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs)